good afternoon. It's great to see you at the drive-in gospel meeting this afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to begin by singing the hymn on our hymn sheet, Down from the glory the Saviour came, down to the cross and the death of shame, gazing in wonder, I there exclaim, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. This is my boost and this my song, Jesus died for me. We'll sing the whole hymn on the back of our hymn sheet. Down from the glory the Saviour came, down to the cross and the death of shame, in wonder I there explain, Jesus died for me, Jesus died for me, Jesus died for me. salvation to the whosoever will. And so we give thanks 
for this message. We pray that Adam would be given hope this afternoon as he would share it with us. We pray that even as those would listen this afternoon, that they wouldn't just hear the words, but they would consider how it applies to their own lives. And even today in this driving or listening to her, that they for the first time would be able to say along with that hymn, that they would come to understand that Jesus died for me. And so we ask for help and blessing today. We pray that a soul would even be saved for the great eternity. And so we ask all these things, returning thanks in the worthy and precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, now I hand over the meeting to Adam. Thank you, David. And we just add our own welcome to everyone who has come along to the gospel meeting this afternoon. We appreciate your presence. It's a lovely day now. We seem to get different weather every week, but we appreciate you coming along to hear the message of the gospel. I want to read maybe just a couple of verses, and they're found in the gospel according to Matthew and chapter 8. Matthew and chapter 8. It's a very interesting chapter, Matthew chapter 8. It starts off with the Lord Jesus healing a leper, and then goes on to him healing the servant of a centurion. Then he heals Peter's wife's mother. And then he calms the storm in the sea. And then he comes to this little bit we're going to read about here in chapter 8 and verse 28. It says this, And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass that way this is the verse that's been on my mind for a couple of weeks and behold they cried out saying what have we to do with thee Jesus thou son of God art thou come hither to torment us before the time I'm going to read that verse again and behold, they cried out, saying, What are we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And we trust that God will add a blessing to the reading of his precious word. And you might say that's a very strange verse to read in a gospel meeting. And sometimes when we have to take a gospel meeting, Verses come readily to our minds, and right away, you know, I'm going to speak on that. And this verse has been on my mind for a couple of weeks, and I tried to get other things just to speak on, but I kept coming back to this verse. So, with God's help, we'll try and present what God has laid upon my heart. Every week, Sunday by Sunday by Sunday, Someone stands behind this little desk here and seeks to preach the gospel from the Bible. And there's one common theme that runs through all the messages. People read from the Old Testament. They read from the New Testament. They read from the Gospels. They read from the Epistles. They have different illustrations. But there's one theme that links them all. And that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And dear friend, in the car park today, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if there's been a moment in your life when you trusted Christ and somebody made you come here and talk in front of the people, what would your thing be? I judge it would be very, the very same. doesn't matter where you go on a Sunday. Doesn't matter, you may differ, differ, differ with me in parts of theology and practices. But when it boils down to it, what we're trying to do here week by week is present one man, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why is he the focus of all our messages? Well, first of all, it's because of who he is. We've sung together, down from the glory, the Saviour came. We believe that that one called Jesus of Nazareth 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven and came down and walked as a man upon this earth. He was absolutely unique. Never was one like him. One without sin, without spot, without blemish. Absolutely pure, absolutely holy. The Son of God. God manifest in flesh. Do I understand that? Not fully, no. But the Bible teaches it. And I believe it. And that one who moved through the scene of time, the one who is the theme of the gospel, is the very son of the living God. So why do we preach him? Simply because of what he means to us and what he has done for us. Again, every believer is united in this. He's the first of 10,000 to our souls. He's altogether lovely. The chief of 10,000. None like him. Because of what he has done for us. Because you see, each of us were sinners. The Bible makes it very, very clear. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It makes it doubly clear. It says there is none righteous, no, not one. It says that every mouth shall be stopped and all the world guilty before God. That takes you in. That takes me in. Every one of us in sin. Do you believe that? Does it mean anything to you? Do you really grasp the seriousness of it? That your sin will forever separate you from God if it's never forgiven. It will keep you at a distance from the God who loves you and who made you. And it will land you in a place of eternal punishment if it's not dealt with. But we preach Christ because he means so much of, to us because he, of what he has done for us. First of all, because of him, that which we deserved was held back. Each of us deserved the judgment of God against our sin because the God that we each have to do with is holy, he's pure, and he will not have sin in his presence. The Bible makes it clear that nothing that defiles will ever enter into his presence. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done, that what we deserve is held back from us. But there's more than that. Because that which we don't deserve is given to us. The grace of God is evident in the believer's life because God has given them what he does not deserve. Given them eternal life. Given them peace with God. A peace that passes all understanding. Does that mean every believer lives a perfect life down here? No, we all know that's not the case. But one day we'll be perfect. One day we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. But the change that he has made in our lives is why we seek to present Christ as the way of salvation. The gospel summed up in 1 Corinthians. It tells us that Christ died for our sins. That's the reason for it. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel very simply put in a few words and that's what we're trying to get across to you today. So that's what we think of him. What does the world think of him? What does society think of him? Well, you know, there's some things that they cannot deny. They cannot deny the historical fact that he lived. There's more evidence about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ than any other personality that ever walked upon this earth. They cannot deny that he was born. They cannot deny that he moved through Israel's land. 
They cannot deny that he died. And they really cannot deny that he rose again from the dead. Paul, when he wrote those verses in 1 Corinthians, he said he was seen of Cephas, he was seen of the twelve, he was seen of James, he was seen of 500 brethren at once, and he says the most of them are still alive. So when Paul was writing that uh, letter to the Corinthians, he says, those that saw him risen from the dead, they're still alive. You could go and speak to them. You could go and ask them questions. They'll tell you. He rose from the dead. It's remarkable, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's one man, one unique person. We see him when he steps out into public ministry when he begins to be about 30 years of age. And this one man is walking along the banks of the Jordan River. And John the Baptist, who is out preaching to the people to repent, he sees the Lord Jesus walking along the banks of the Jordan and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. One man. John points him out. If you read through the Gospels carefully, you'll see that one man calls another two men. And then another two men. And before long there's twelve. There's the Saviour, twelve disciples. If you read on a bit further, you'll see he sends seventy out, two by two, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You'll see that multitudes are beginning to flock around him to hear his words. You'll see that there's many that bring the sick and the possessed out into the streets that he might heal. Begins with one man. There's multitudes. People will be telling me this week about the Gulf in Newcastle and the big crowds that are going to the Gulf. There's going to be a day, dear friend, when there's crowds that we can't number. We'll be singing praise to that man that walked along the Jordan River. 10,000 times 10,000. Thousands of thousands. A multitude that no man can number. Praising God to this man, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the world think of them? There are things that they cannot deny. But the Bible makes it very clear. And if you look at Isaiah 53, I think one of our brethren read in a week or two's past from Isaiah 53. If you read it, have a wee look at the tenses of the phrases in Isaiah 53. It tells us, you know, that he was wounded for our transgressions. Past tense. He was bruised for our iniquities. Past tense. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. Past tense. But right at the start of the chapter it says, He is despised and rejected of men. Present tense. Society has no time for him. There are things they cannot deny about him. But as far as acknowledging his lordship, they have no time for him. Dear friend, can I just pause? What about you? What's your thoughts on him? I'll come to that in a minute or two. Then I was thinking, you know, what does his enemies think of him? I was reading a bit a week or two ago about the Second World War. Don't know why. Sometimes you go onto the internet and you go down a rabbit hole. And I was reading about Churchill and I was reading about Stalin and reading about Hitler and Roosevelt and just the things they said about one another. They were enemies on opposing sides. And what they had to say about each other, well, you would know it wouldn't be complimentary. They despised one another because they were at war. But what about the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ? When he's born, and shortly after it, 
the king, Herod, hated them and sought to wipe him out. It's called the slaughter of the innocents, where children were murdered that he might be destroyed. The religious leaders, when he stepped out into public ministry, those that should have known most about him, those that should have been waiting upon him, they hated him without a cause. He was taking away their place. He was undermining their teaching. And they hated him. They actually sent people to arrest him. And they returned empty-handed because they said, never man speak like this man. What about Pilate? Pilate says, that Pilate who would condemn him to death says, I find no fault in this man. And he would seek with a great ceremony and a great show to wash his hands and say, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. The thief on the cross who was with his friend casting uh, dispersions upon the Saviour who was mocking him, telling him to come down from the cross. He sees the one in the middle cross and he says, this man had done nothing amiss. The centurion that was over the soldiers that would actually carry out that brutal and horrific crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, truly, this was the Son of God. And the little verse that we read together here speaks of demons. And they say, what have we to do with thee? Jesus, the Son of God, art thou come to torment us before the time. The very demons knew that he was the Son of God. And they knew that there was a time when they would be tormented. And they wanted to know, was that time now? Do you realize, dear friend, there's a time coming when God will judge the world? The Bible makes it very clear that every one of us, that's every one of us in this car park, that's every one of us that will listen to my voice, every one of us will give account of himself or herself to God. Now you'll not be asked to give account for your children or your parents. You'll not be asked to give an account for your wife or your husband. You'll not be asked to give an account for your friend or your neighbour. Every one of us will give an account of himself to God. I wonder do you believe that? Well, let me say this kindly. It doesn't really matter whether you believe it or not. It's going to happen. The word of God makes it sure. I might believe that the moon is made of polystyrene. That's not going to make the moon made of polystyrene. Everybody in the world might think the moon is made of polystyrene. That's not going to make the moon made of polystyrene. Your opinion, my opinion, does not change truth. And the truth is, we all have to meet God. The God who created you, the God who sent his son to die in your room instead, the God who provided a salvation that's free to you, one day you will stand before him. I wonder will you stand before him still in your sins? Or will you stand before him in Christ? John writes, you know, he says, I saw a great white throne. And then he writes, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Here's an appointment, dear friend, that you and I will keep. We'll meet God. Nothing will cancel that appointment. Not your indecision. Not your unbelief. 
not even your death. That's an appointment all will keep. The demons acknowledged him as the Son of God. What about you, dear friend? What do you think of the Lord Jesus Christ? What should you think? Well, week by week, and there's only two weeks left in the will of God at the business part, and then we'll be moving back into the hall. There were some here last week who are not here this week. There were some people alive last week that are not alive this week. None of us know how long we've got. What you should do is get to know the person that we present week by week, the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that, you ask? He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Christ. He says, him that cometh to me, I will know wife cast out. If you can't get your head around the coming to Christ, what about receiving him? The Bible says, as many as received him, to them give he power to become the children of God. Come to him. Receive him. What about calling upon him? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Surely you could do that. What about trusting him? Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, he writes about trusting the living God who is the saviour of all men. It's not trusting yourself. It's not trusting where you go on a Sunday. It's not trusting some man. You need to trust the living God who is the saviour of all men. And finally, I think the way that's maybe mentioned most of all is believing on him. John 3, 16. We love to preach it. We love to hear it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have him everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We've thought a wee bit about what the Christians think of him. We've thought a wee bit about what the world and society thinks about him. We've even thought of what the demons think of him. They know there's a time coming when they're going to feel the punishment of God. But let's get to the nitty gritty of it. What do you think of him? The hymn writer puts it this way. What think ye of Christ is the test? And dear friend, that will determine whether you'll be in heaven or hell, whether you'll know the blessings of God or everlasting punishment. I trust that you'll be wise for your own sake and go in for salvation while you have the opportunity. The old now is the accepted time. The old now is the day of salvation. Shall we pray? Our Father, we commend ourselves to thee. We thank thee for the great salvation that thou hast provided. We thank thee it's for the whosoever will. And our simple prayer is that someone will avail themselves of it today. We look to thee for blessing. We do so in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Thank you again for coming.